The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're still in Jude 7. And uh, we still need to always be reminded of the importance of the rebound adjustment to God and not lose sight of that. Uh, it is essential for the intake of the word of God. If you're not under the controlling or filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, then you will not garner the information properly. You won't process it properly. So uh, that's your responsibility. And uh, we are facing the Word of God here. The Word of God is that information that he has preserved for humanity through the individual human authors who were under the special ministry of the Holy Spirit that protected them even accidentally from presenting anything in the Word of God that was erroneous. That had to be that way. Humans are fallible. Uh, we're not talking about people who would purposely put in corrupt information. We're talking about the men through time from Moses to the Apostle John who uh, composed the 66 books of our Bible. And this is the divine viewpoint. This must be communicated for believers to flourish and to gain the full measure of divine blessing in time and at the judgment seat of Christ. So whatever you need to do, this is the time to do it. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. We thank you that you continue to provide for positive volition in this place the necessary wherewithal to assemble, to be challenged, to be changed in Christ. We thank you and ask you to bless this class to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. You might have already known this, but always to be refreshed with regard to matters spiritually is important. Repetition is essential in anything in life, and it is with regard to truth, or it may be that this is the first time you ever intellectually engaged yourself with the particular information that we're covering. And so this exposes so much evil that is in our country and world today. And it tells us that in the time of Abraham, God destroyed the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, the cities of the cities of that fertile plain, wiped them all out. Nobody survived except for Lot and his two daughters that they were escorted out. And so just as Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these, they stepped over a major line. It wasn't just because they were pagans. There's pagans everywhere, all through the nations. It was a particular vice and a particular practice of it at, a high, at this level that brought this sudden demise to this otherwise economically affluent civilization. One day it was there and the one day it was gone, destroyed by fire. And they stepped over this line uh, specifically here what is mentioned of all kinds of sexual perversions that exist. It was that of the male-to-male -male thing, the homosexual thing. Since they in the same way as these, that refers us back to the preceding example where these angels broke their state of celibacy, those that did. And so since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality, we noticed that we had, we have 
this one Greek verb, ek pornuo. And uh, it means to, uh, how, would you, how would you translate it? I mean, it, it's, uh, pornuo is the basic verb, which means uh, to have sex out of marriage, basic fornication, so forth. Man, woman, stuff. But this one puts the ek on it, ek, and it's out from. It's like something beyond that. So uh, they've done a good job translating indulged in gross immorality. Misbehave sexually, that's too weak. People that are involved in sex outside marriage misbehave sexually. Basic fornication. Man, woman. This is over the top completely. It's a particular word that is chosen here. And went after strange flesh. That, re, that reiterates it or it explains the gross immorality aspect. It explains it as going after strange flesh. Strange flesh, heteros, we get heterosexual. This is, this is, this is strange or different flesh. Man, man. That, therefore, qualifies for the strange flesh factor. Man, woman, you wouldn't call it strange flesh. You might call it immorality, but you wouldn't call it strange flesh. It's another way of designating this activity. And then we learned that they are put on exhibit as an example. What's put on exhibit? All these people died. Men, women, children, animals, everything was wiped out on that occasion. So what, 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 what's the exhibit? in undergoing punishment of eternal fire. All right, the, they're exhibited as an example. Uh, here again, a very bad example, but an example to others to not go down that path. And what the, what the exhibit is, is, and we'll see it in a verse from Second Peter where he discusses the same thing in a, in a similar context dealing with the, this similar type people as a threat to believers that he said that those cities were reduced to ashes and they weren't built out of wood. They weren't, they weren't some wooden forts. <laughs> These were stone mortar buildings and the heat was so intense that they were reduced to ashes. Everything. That's the power of billions and billions of these little balls I showed you falling out of the sky. Remember the two angels that got Lot out of there from last night? They said, we're going to do it. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the abilities that God has put in angels to accomplish things. I mean, it's, it's, truly, it's truly amazing. They're not God, but they have God-like qualities that they can do these things. Angels delivered the manna to the Jews. They catered it in every day as an example. Uh, we just accept it by faith and we move on and recognize that they have this ability. All right. We ended up with documenting from Scripture, and I owe it to you, to anything I say, anything I affirm, I owe it to you to provide you with the documentation. Now, your part is to embrace it as truth. Once, whether it's rebound or any other doctrine, it's your responsibility after that to embrace it as God's truth and live under it, come what may. And, uh, you know, it's just show me in the Bible. And uh, I might tell someone about something. I might say, you know, in conversation, I've done it a few times with individuals in different locations, usually out there uh, in some shop or some business or something. Uh, where they express the fact that they're Christians and 
and, and, and maybe have some understanding of, you know, of uh, Christ is going to return, the rapture, it's, it's all over, spread all over out there. I will, I will, I'll just drop something on them. It's what I call testing the waters. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to lord it over them. I'm just trying to see if there's any interest there. Did you know the United States is in prophecy? What? I can get you the documentation. It's very clear. Every doctrine doesn't have to be something that makes you all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> doctrine is what it is. And it sometimes... It, it hits us hard. I can show you examples in the Bible where what the prophet had to deliver, the message he had to deliver, it wasn't personally pleasant to him, but it isn't the matter of whether it was personally pleasant to him. It is God's word, and he had a job to do, and that was to discharge a very unpopular message to a bunch of Israelites that were facing the fifth cycle of discipline. So that's what I have to do. That's why you're told in Bible class not to be quick to anger and quick to mouth off about something. Ponder it, pray about it, look up the verses, and you too will see some things will come easy, some things are straightforward, some things are a little more difficult. Not difficult not necessarily technically, but just difficult because of the human viewpoint that we as humans have been exposed to and carry around. We get it from a, all kinds of sources. We get it from the, you know, the TV, from all kinds of different places, information's coming out. Some of it's just neutral, you know. It was 100 degrees today or something, they'd say fine. But some of it is colored. You, uh, anybody stepping into doctrine new is is in for a ride. They are in for a ride. You've been out there in the world, and oh, I went to church, yeah, but they didn't explain this stuff to you. Churches today are backing off on touching on this topic because they lose members. Because somebody out there in the church has a, has a lesbian daughter, as a for instance, as an illustration, and that'll offend them. And so these pastors are cowardly and they will not teach this information for the well-being of their congregation. And if it runs somebody off, it runs them off. And when you're witnessing to people and maybe even inviting them to Maranatha Church, don't be upset or don't feel bad if they don't like it. The chances are they're not going to. The odds are. I'm just talking odds. <laughs> and so you just, you just recognize that fact. It's all right to, to, to invite people. Uh, some people do it kind of the hardcore way. I don't advocate that. You aren't gonna like it. <laughs> Did you ever hear anybody say that about going to church? You're not gonna like it. But chances are, odds are really high that they aren't. How many people I've seen walk in here and turn right around and walk out, they couldn't even get through 15 minutes of it. And I'm just teaching a basic doctrine in some instances, basic, basic ABCs. See, the Bible talks about, you know, the milk of the word, that's basics. That's your ABCs, that's your foundation. And on that you build and go to more advanced doctrines and concepts. But I can't stop and just do ABCs for everybody. I teach a group that's at different spiritual levels. So homosexuality and page 27, and lesbianism constitute abnormal and gross sexual perversion in God's word. When we looked up Romans 1, 26 and 27. All other kind of deviant activity can be found in Leviticus 18. The basic thing is, remember, well, we'll get to it. In the prosperous cities of the then verdant valley of, uh, valley of the Jordan Plain, this practice had reached militant proportions. And there's a particular context here. It isn't just homosexuality as it's existed among people and this person, come, they've come to find out they were, uh, you know. Uh, this is, in other words, it was being forced upon people apart from their consent. 
with little or no interference from the authorities. That's why we have authorities in the divine institution, is to shut that stuff down. There ought to be penalties for that, as with child abuse or any of it. I just keep hearing bad news from this country all the time. It just never ends. In, 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 in of course, California. They want to reduce down the penalties for child abuse when they ought to execute them or castrate them. A lot of that, but that is another vice that is rampant in our civilization and the elite are involved in it in trafficking children all over the place. They're not content to have a woman that's of age that they could have any time, any place. They got to go after kiddos. This stuff is being taught in universities. See, we went from this isn't, this isn't right to now that's okay, and then we just keep going down, down, down. Welcome to the last of the last days. It's not pretty, but it's what it is. And the wrath of God's on the horizon. Yes, these anybody that's involved in those kind of, can be saved. Paul says in Corinthians to the Corinthians, he lists various vices, con men, homosexuals. He said, such were some of you. But they became believers. coerced homosexuality, brought much misery upon both citizen and hapless visitor, as seen in the use of the noun outcry. Outcry? We also have the expression in the Bible, and, and this, the, 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 it might sound metaphorical, but people who have been killed, believers, unbelievers, through various evil things going on, their blood cries out from the ground for vengeance. And vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So there's a lot of suffering imposed on people besides this. There's a lot of suffering imposed on people in the world as a result of policies that, are in, that, are, are, that, are, that nations have put into place. And we're at the, we're, we're at the front line of that. God's going to pay America back for all the blood it shed on this earth it shouldn't have shed. I got the verse. It's Revelation 18. All the bloodshed. It kind of, it's kind of like doing an investigation and we trace it all back and it comes to your doorstep. We financed terrorism. We financed communism. We financed Russia during the Soviet era or it would have died before it got going. Lend-Lease, Exum Bank, and they were killing millions and millions of Russians, far more than Hitler killed, even if you believe the figures on Hitler. That's just one example. We're in, we, we have, with our politicians, our, we've been in bed with these people. We finance these things. It, it's a payday is coming and the Americans who are living here and in this country are going to reap that for all the ones before that did what they did a whole civilization will perish like Sodom and Gomorrah in one hour of one day and it will be fire it won't be these things it will be that arsenal Russia has over there it will be unleashed We're working, we're working down that road. There's The outcry refers to all that misery. Young boys were forced into this awful lifestyle. 19, this noun means to call out for help when under great distress. Homosexual gangs roamed the streets at night. Apparently they didn't during the daytime because they had to make, people had to prosper there. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to use common sense on this. It was a free-for-all 
when the sun went down. That's the story we have with the two angels, these two male angels appearing as male visitors to the city who came that evening. The second error is participle following the conjunction translate went refers to the pursuit of this vice on the part of the large, larger male population. I'm not saying every male was involved in it. I mean, Lot's, Lot's two daughters had fiancés. Of course, I don't know the details there. But isn't Lot a case study? No, really, I mean, he, it's a, he's a real case study. He's a believer. He's Abraham's nephew. He's been around Abraham. He's heard all the truth. But what drove him was getting richer. Being rich, being prosperous wasn't enough. He had to have more. He had to have more. And so he lifted up his eyes and saw Sodom. Him and Abraham had to know what went on there. These people, this information floats around. Even other Canaanites would say, boy, that's way off the, that's way off the charts. There are pagans with norms and standards, by the way. The Romans, although they could be hypocritical, the Romans looked down on this vice because there was a certain version of it practiced among the Greeks. And the Romans looked down on this. So some, so some Gentile nations had more norms and standards than others, even though they were all pagan. They weren't all by any mean equal in their evil and deserving of what happened to these people. This, uh, this, uh, this outcry then led to this destruction. All right. It is used with the preposition after uh, and its object is strange flesh. The adjective strange is heteros, which means other or different. 24, within the context of the morality of the word of God, it refers to that which is off limits according to divine design. 25, the divine design provides for sexual relations between male and female, married male and female, for the purpose of producing the next generation of humans for the purpose of pleasure and recreation. That's all fine. That's not sinful at all. The divine design, okay, sex between males or females constitutes going after strange flesh. 27, flesh refers to the physical person. So the flesh that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah went after was different in the sense that it was not the flesh God designated for the male of the species to pursue for sexual gratification with the female of the species. That's the divine design. And of course, in the devil's world, everything in certain places gets turned upside down. God designed from the beginning the female to be the object of sexual pleasure within the context of divine institution number two, or marriage. The four divine institutions. This is basic Bible doctrine, to know the four divine institutions. The divine institutions are for the entirety of the human race. The first one is volition, free will. He has implanted in everybody free will, and he does not tamper with free will. He can bring pressures to bear on people so they will turn to him and so forth, but that's not, mess, that's not, free will, that's not overruling uh, their free will. Angels were given free will, and we know what some of them did with it. The second, of course, in order of their existence is marriage. Show you the importance of marriage as an institution, and living together is not marriage. You have to have it authorized by the existing authority. Well, the only existing authority was Yahweh, who happened to be their teacher in the garden, and he united the first members in marriage, Adam and Eve. It was an actual ceremony, an event. And it's usually done, the size of the audience varies, but at least there's witnesses. 
you know, at least a couple, two or three witnesses and beyond who witness that these two, and, it, it, and we also, we also uh, uh, honor what the state wants uh, to know that these, this couple is married for all the purposes that they have to know that information. But no common law, none of this business. It's all over out there, as you well know. Complete disregard for the divine institution. The third divine institution follows logically children, a family. And the fourth came much later, nations. All this is under attack in our world. We are suffering from the ravages of the New World Order crowd to bring humanity into a one world government. Not separate nations with boundaries and what God set up. And of course, without the United States and its money and its influence, the New World Order and, 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 and its institutions would probably not be running like it is at all today. The United States uh, Congress defeated the first attempt at it, League of Nations. We had some honorable senators. They stood against it. But after World War II, we got the UN and all that mess and all these attempts to bring everybody, but it will never work. God authorized nationalism, and it continues to be frustrated. They can't, they, they want to bring all these nations in, but they, they, they don't always cooperate. <laughs> Russia's not cooperating. Russia happens to be right now a completely different entity than it was under the Soviet dictators. It's nationalistic. It is not pro-gay. Not Putin. There's gays in Russia, of course, but it's not, they're not, they weren't, they, they weren't going to promote this in the Olympics, and they got, they got bad-mouthed all over the place because they're not playing this. They're not players. God eventually, point 30, responded to this outcry with wrath, which exterminated the entire population of four of the five cities. Remember, Lot went to the fifth city, the little tiny one, because he just wanted, can I just stay in that city? Sure. We'll, we'll grant you, here, here's, here's two angels. I guess they had orders ahead of time, knew what was coming up, but they had the authority to tell Lot, you can go to that fifth city. Live out your life. And he went there. But he's a believer in reversionism. And his STA just pushes him every which way. And he's living under fear. So he hightails it out of there and goes off to some cave somewhere. Do you know that Lot had his bacon saved twice by Abraham's intervention? Twice. Would you went out there to risk your men and everything against a powerful enemy, uh, even if they were uh, encamped? Would you do that for a lot? And then he interceded for him. He was trying to say, can you spare the place, spare the place? If there's 10, if there's 20, if, if, you know, all that. So the Lord the figure that he was in, went one way and the two angels went down and, and Lot was not destroyed with, those, with the wicked on that occasion. But he's a, he's a mess. He can talk the God stuff if he needs to and probably even believe some of it. But his God was money. Ne never was enough. And where does he end up? In a cave. And where does Abraham end up? Rich in the land, God prospered him, materially, temporally. Because Abraham had his eyes on God, his word, and his plan, not getting rich. 
Oh, it's nice to prosper if you could do it under God's hand, and he did. He rained brimstone and, or sulfur upon the region, igniting it with fire. The horrific heat generated by the burning sulfur reduced everything to ashes, 2 Peter 2.6. The crowd, uh, the, 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 the false teachers or the, the in, false influences that were bothering the believers in the, the writing of Second Peter, uh, have it's like they're the same as what Jude is dealing with. I mean, the language, I mean, he adds his own deal. Uh, he uses the same example as Jude used. For if God did not, I'll read verse four. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, Genesis 6, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And it's that, it's that blight there called the Dead Sea. It's called dead because nothing for the longest time would grow there. Nothing. Plants and things tend to make it in some very extreme environments. Deserts, so forth. Guess what? The area in the Dead Sea, you can find it on the YouTube if you want to run it down. It's starting to show signs of life. And it isn't because anything man's done. He isn't pumping more water in there or anything like that. It's starting to show life. And that fulfills prophecy too. Because when Christ reigns on earth, that area will be as fertile, at least, as it was in the day of Abraham, before the destruction. It says fishermen will line the shores fishing. And certain types of aquatic and plant life is starting to sprout. And these guys ran around on this and showed pictures of it. It's coming back to life. And this was not anything recent. This is just, I mean, something recent. It isn't something that's been going on. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. It's a little tidbit. But that still doesn't, that, that, that still means that this, this destruction of this place. Uh, it's left as, a, as the, as the uh, exhibit, if you will. The physical evidence of such a destruction is visible along the shores of the Dead Sea. We drove our car up and down there back in 1999 looked out over there. There's some strange structures and things that don't look natural. Remnants of what happened. The eerie shapes of city walls and buildings are evident on both shores of the Dead Sea. How can people miss this? They know the Bible story. They can go down there and look at this and draw the conclusion from the Bible, why did God do this? That vice and his particular manifestation among those particular Canaanites led to the destruction. An absolute rendering this place uninhabitable for people in the normal sense. Yeah, they can go vacation there and get in the mineral baths and that's all good and fine. Build a big hotel on it. Embedded in the ash are balls of unburned sulfur. I have one of them up here. He left a little, another little tidbit of evidence. Some people were out there digging in the right place with shovels, and they found these things. There is no natural explanation for why they would be in this type of a ball in that condition. None. 
Sulfur does not, you don't find sulfur in nature this way. It doesn't roll up into tight little balls with magnesium in it. And again, we go back to God has let, left evidences on this earth of the integrity of the Word of God. And one of them is the Red Sea Crossing. And go see that. Type in Red Sea Crossing. Go entertain yourself. Watch these guys out there. And see what they have to say and what they've seen and they saw over there. The, Mount, the, real, the real Mount Sinai isn't in the Sinai Peninsula. That was picked by a woman who was a, a religious type, but not, 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 not biblical or scholarly based. So death rather than life marked the whole region. The region constitutes an exhibit or warning as to what God thinks of the practice and acceptance of this unnatural vice. And today, it's all okay, isn't it? It's promoted. Our federal government, Department of Justice, sets aside Gay Pride Month. We have Gay Pride Parades. Even in our own town. I ran into one up in New York City when we were up there on a Sunday, because we're gonna go out and look at that, that island out there where the Statue of Liberty is and take that boat ride around and do stuff. And we got slowed down because our bus had to stop and wait for all these freaks to go by. They got a permit to do it. There was one whole community in Seattle when we were there, oh, unbelievable. They had nothing on Halloween. Absolute freak show. Men and women. All their garb, all their stuff, covered in tattoos, all this stuff in their face and the, all of it. Satan makes absolute monkeys out of people. Absolute fools out of people. So this, again, mirrors Peter's statement in 2.6. But I got, I got it. And it says, you know, we, we, there was, and if he rescued Lot, that's verse 7, 2 Peter 2. If he rescued, oh, I left a word out. Would you use this word in connection with Lot? Righteous Lot. <laughs> Here's the guy that wanted to turn his two daughters over to this mob, right? All, almost for me, a low point. He's called Righteous Lot. Well, he was a believer. And as a believer, he wasn't totally de devoid of all norms and standards. It's just that he was driven by, where's the, where's the best place in the area to get rich? I mean, make, make a killing. Sodom, economically. That's why he moved and quit his cattle business If I was doing a movie about this, it would probably be rated R, but if I did a movie about this, I would have Lot having several positions, but one of them might have him as being in the salt business. It was, it's, it's a commodity. <laughs> and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct, sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Okay. Now, you put money first, and now you're miserable. You're making money, but you're constantly tormented by what you're observing because as a human being, you don't go for that business. Not in a bit. 
but yet you put you and your family in that place instead of trying to figure, I mean, if you're not going to get with Abraham and all that, find some other place to go. But no. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, testing, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. And we'll have occasion to come back to this later on in our verses here in Jude. Peter has a comment to those who would live ungodly thereafter. So this is for history. This is a history lesson for nations that follow. Don't go there, because you could end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. But look at the United States as an example. Uh, sorry, I let the word planted in there, but on the face of this earth is a place that serves as a warning to all peoples of all time of the dire consequences of the promotion and practice of this homosexual vice. That place is within the territory of the state of Israel, part of their land grant. The verb are exhibited is correctly translated. It means to put on display. To put on display. Occurring five times in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 8.12. I guess so. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. All right. When I do that, then I get, you say, out of fellowship. <laughs> yeah, that can happen too. Uh, there in 618, it's uh, the hope set before us. I presume. And 12, 1 and 2. Yeah, it's set before us. It's okay. Let's just go on. And Jude 7. The ungodly scoff at this. But the liberals of our day will see that God's silent exhibit is not to be mocked at or overlooked or ignored. They're about to face it. That's where we are in history. We're right on the edge of it. Thank God. That all this stuff that's been running amok in our country and world, it's about to be shut down. And there's so much more, of course. All right, I'll let you go. I'll see you Sunday. Uh, Sunday we have the Lord's table at the end of second session and our deacons meet. We also, for anyone who is interested, uh, the week after that, if the weather holds and everything's fine, we're going to have, if you haven't, if you've already done it, fine. Uh, we have at least one person. Uh, we're going to have our baptism service. And we'll give you the details. And that will be not not the 20th, but the 27th. All right, let's close class. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, encourage us as we live in these perilous and evil times. In Jesus' name, amen.